Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Devotees. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya. Merci beaucoup. Premananda Prabhu, Vini Isi. Happy birthday. <laughs> we heard the news. Yes, devotees, Hare Krishna. So we are continuing with our study of the, the demons in Krishna's Vrindavan Leela. And we have quite a few demons to, to talk about. What do we have? We've got about, I think, it may be 13 or so. So we have to move along. Yesterday, the last one we talked about was Agasura, who represented envy, cruelty, this sort of thing. Next is the Brahma Vimohana Leela. Of course, Lord Brahma is obviously is not a demon, but somehow or other, by the arrangement of the Lord, he got into some sort of you know, contaminated type of consciousness in which he thought that Krishna is just an ordinary little boy and the residents of Vrindavan, uh, they're just simple village people and therefore they take this little village boy too seriously. Yeah. So Lord Brahma thought, I'll show them. I'll show them all. I'll show Krishna and I'll show everyone who's really important around here. So this pastime, this pastime actually occurred on Lord Balaram's appearance day. Balaram was not present. He was at home having a party with his mother and others in the village. So he was not present and he didn't know what had happened, the whole sort of background, because this whole thing goes on for a year. The event itself, there's the event itself, but then the ramifications go on for an entire year. And Lord Balaram is there all the time, but he doesn't know that something is strange. So anyway, well, there are two pastimes which occur on Balaram's appearance day. The other one is the... Uh, chastisement of Kaliya. It also happened on Balaram's appearance day. And Balaram, at least initially, was not present when... Anyway, we'll, we'll get on to that in due course when we come to Kaliya. But that's just a little background information. So now in this case, uh, This, this happened, actually, immediately after 
the killing of Agasura immediately after His Holiness Bhakti Dear Damada Maharaja Ki Hari Bhav Welcome, Bienvenue. Please give Maharaj a nice seat. He can use this deluxe seat, possibly. Yeah, give, give Maharaj this super duper. In Russia, we would call this you won't believe what this would be called. I mean, it's a bit of a joke. It would be called Super Pooper. <laughs> And I'm not joking either. <laughs> it's just a common saying. May ko ko Maharaj Pushonte Kirtan. What would you say? Oh, Ala Rafiatra. Kirtan la. Who extra super? <laughs> Wait. Say. Okay. <laughs> okay. All right. So here we are then. It's Lord Balaram's appearance day, and it's just immediately after. Well, in fact, it's on the same day as the killing of Agasura. Hari Bol. Prabhupada explains in the tenth canto that you know all these there, there's all these demons described in Krishna's Vrindavan Leela. <coughs> you know, like we said yesterday, you could say 21, although some of them are, are not demons like Lord Brahma. But anyway, there's 21 incidents at least, uh, and generally with actual demons. As described in Shrimad Bhagavatam, but Prabhupada describes that in fact there were a lot more. It's not just that this was all there was and that was it. Prabhupada explains there in the tenth canto purports. Prabhupada says that actually every day there was a demon would come just before lunch time. Some demon or other, just before lunch, Krishna would kill the demon in some spectacular fight, and then everyone understood. Ah, time for lunch, and they take a lunch break, and then things would go on. Uh, the cow herding and playing. Would go on after lunch into the afternoon into the later afternoon, and then in the late afternoon, maybe four or five o'clock, something like that, another demon would come every day, and of course Krishna would fight the demon, kill the demon, and then everyone would know. Ah, time to go home. Prabhupada explains this was all arranged by Yoga Maya, Pornamasi. Otherwise, point one, they would never stop for lunch. If this interruption didn't occur, they they'd never stop for lunch because they're having too much fun. And then later on, the second demon, uh, if that didn't happen, they'd never go home. Because they're just so happy, playing with Krishna. So these are like the main demons or the main incidents, you could say. So yeah, just immediately after Agasura is killed, they took a lunch break, and they're taking lunch in some nice place. You know, there are different places. A lot of these pastimes. 
the places are known where they actually occurred. This one, there are two possible places. One is by, well, if you know Vrindavan town, uh, Brahmakund. Are you familiar with Bra Brahmakund? It's kind of central Vrindavan town. And not too far from the, the old Radhagovinda temple, on the way to the Gopeshwar Shiva temple, is Brahmakund. Uh, many say the pastime happened there. Uh, and then others, there's another place. There's another place. It's, if you drive out from Vrindavan town out to the main sort of north-south road, the Delhi-Agra highway, then just near there, up, up the highway a couple of kilometers, but then in again on the right, is a place called Chomuha, which in the local dialect means four faces. Chomuha. And some say the pastime took place there. But anyway, they sat down to take lunch. And so they're enjoying lunch in the company of Krishna. And suddenly they realized the cows the calves, rather, this is, they're still, Krishna's still herding the calves, not the cows yet. The calves, they realized the calves had disappeared. There were nice green grasses nearby, and the calves had gone off, and the cowherd boys were enjoying lunch with Krishna, and then they realized they've just gone. So, so naturally the boys became anxious because it's a major responsibility given by their parents. And if something happens to the calves, you know, if just one of them gets hurt, what to speak of all of them disappearing, oh, it's going to be big trouble. Big trouble with the parents. So they became very anxious. And they're just about to go running out to find them when Krishna said, don't worry, just stay here, continue having lunch. I'll go and find them. This is in the part of the 10th canto where Srila Prabhupada is still translating and commenting. Actually, it's the very last part. It's the last chapter. It's the last chapter, 13, that Prabhupada did. And Prabhupada makes a very nice point that just see how merciful Krishna is to his devotees. That he, he said, I'll go and find them. You stay and have lunch. In, in other words, I... You don't need to inconvenience yourselves. Krishna's very kind to his devotees. So Krishna went off to find the calves, didn't find them because they had been stolen by Lord Brahma, came back, and the cowherd boys had disappeared because they had also been stolen by Lord Brahma, who is thinking, I want to teach this Krishna a lesson. Now he thinks he's important. And I want to show the village people that this Krishna, he's not important. Because the village people were glorifying Krishna quite regularly. And Lord Brahma was thinking he's just an ordinary boy. Because you know the name Krishna in India is not uncommon. It's a fairly common name. Even I was here, I, when I came for the Kirtan Mela, if you remember that a few years ago, came to Haridev Prabhu's house. We had a little, you know, little program, and then devotees left, and there was one boy there, 
young boy, like, I mean, 12, 13 years old. I asked him, what's your name? He said, Krishna. I said, really? I've been looking for you for years. <laughs> but then I found out he was not that Krishna, the big one from up there. He was just the ordinary Krishna. So Lord Brahma was thinking like that. So he stole the coward boys and calves, thinking that then Krishna would have to go home alone. And all the parents would ask him, where are our sons? Where are the calves? And Krishna would just not be able to say anything. And then everyone would think that Krishna is just an ordinary person and even they'd be angry with Krishna. Why didn't you look after them? Why only you come back? So Krishna expanded himself into identical forms to the cowherd boys and calves. But now all these personalities are forms of Krishna. Yes, we should turn off our phones. Next phone that rings, we will confiscate and sell on the black market with SIM card to, to fund the expansion of Bhaktivedanta Ashram. Okay, for a good cause. So yeah, this was, the, this was Brahma's idea, but now Krishna expanded and of course, all the parents, they loved Krishna more than their own children. And all the cows, they loved Krishna more than their calves. So now all the cowherd boys and calves are Krishna. So the parents and the cows found that their love for their children was just now increasing and becoming just like their love for Krishna. It was amazing. And even the gopis, the gopis, they were thinking that, well, you know, we're going to have to marry. That's the way it works. Who are we going to marry? Well, the local boys, of course. Radharani will marry Krishna, and we will be stuck with the other boys who, you know, they're all right, but they're just, they're nothing like Krishna. But now all the boys were Krishna. And all the gopis started thinking, well, actually, you know, I wouldn't mind marrying one of these cowherd boys. Yeah. So a big marriage was arranged. All the gopis married all the cowherd boys who were Krishna. And everyone was very happy. Of course, after a year, the regular cowherd boys returned. And the regular calves. But, you know, we don't know what happened when all the regular cowherd boys came back and took over as the husbands of the gopis. Okay, so then... Lord Brahma came back, according to his time, he came back just momentarily. According to our time, it was a year later. Because <coughs> Lord Brahma's time and our time is very, diff very different. For him, a few seconds or one minute is at least a year here. So he came, came back expecting to see there's Krishna all bewildered and everyone's angry with Krishna and everyone's up upset and no one is taking Krishna seriously. But he came and he saw there's all the cowherd boys and calves. What happened? So he quickly went back to check where he had hidden them and they were there also. And then he came back, and they're there also again in Vrindavan. And then Lord Brahma, it just became too much for him. 
and Krishna, suddenly the cowherd boys and calves manifested four armed forms. And Lord Brahma realized, whoops, mistake. Sorry about that. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> ah. Yeah. So then he surrendered to Krishna. Yeah, he surrendered to Krishna and he offered his prayers to Krishna. Krishna was still there with fruit and yogurt in his left hand. Left hand. We normally only eat with our right hand. Krishna sometimes eats with his left hand. And Lord Brahma started offering his prayers which are in the 14th chapter of the 10th canto, which was not translated by Prabhupada. 13th was the last. And there's Krishna. He's under the influence of Yoga Maya. And Krishna thought, who is this four-headed man? Why is he in such anxiety? What is going on? He is offering prayers, it seems to me. But why to me? I'm just a cowherd boy. Anyway, he seems very upset, so I won't just go away. I better stand there and wait till he finishes just to sort of humor him and pacify him. But, but I hope he finishes quickly, because I have important things to do because I am a cowherd boy. So Lord Brahma offered his prayers. Some very important verses are there, extremely important. Srila Vishnath Chakravati Thakur says, I will cross over the ocean of material existence on the boat of the prayers of Lord Brahma. Yeah. So they're very important prayers. Then the Lord excuses Lord Brahma. And Prabhupada brings up a very interesting point. You know, we mentioned, if you recall, that Krishna would kill a demon in the late afternoon and everyone would understand, oh, time to go home. But now, he didn't, this day he didn't do it. Prabhupada says, actually, uh, Lord Brahma stole Maya cowherd boys and calves. And the real cowherd boys and calves, they just continued wandering in the forest for one year. And Nanda Maharaj and his associates would take out the cows every day. But by the arrangement of Yoga Maya, even though the cowherd boys and calves are just, they're just moving around the same area, not far from the village, but they, their paths never crossed for one year. So that the cowherd men didn't know that our sons, the actual sons and the actual calves us, they're still around. Yes, so then after that, uh, Krishna withdrew the cowherd boys and expanded cowherd boys and calves. And the Anatha, of course, well, as you see there, the Anatha is to think that Aishvarya is more important than Madhurya. Opulence is more, is like on a higher level of spirituality of Krishna consciousness than sweetness. And, you know, to uh, explain why that is not the case, well, I mean, we could do a whole seminar about it. It's a very nice subject. But one very interesting discussion where this whole matter is discussed in some detail, 
It's in Chaitanya Charitamrita. Uh, where is it? It's somewhere in Chaitanya Charitamrita. And Lord Chaitanya is in, in uh, Sri Rangam in South India. During his tour of South India, he spent six years there. And he stays in Sri Rangam, which is one of the headquarters of the Sri Sampradaya. And they're different from us. They, you know, they're similar, but they're definitely somewhat significantly different. And the first main difference is they regard Lakshmi Narayan as being the topmost. And Krishna, Radha Krishna, Krishna is a Leela avatar of Narayan, an expansion for pastimes. So there's this really nice, nice discussion of Lord Chaitanya with one of those devotees named Venkata Bhatta, who happens to be the father of Gopal Bhatta, who becomes Gopal Bhatta Goswami of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan. Yeah. So Lord Chaitanya, you know, we haven't really got time to go into all the details. It's such an interesting discussion. You should locate it in uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita and read it very carefully. But the basic idea is that Lord Chaitanya, he's staying with Venkata Bhatta for four months for the rainy season. And Venkata Bhatta is very nice, a very nice devotee, but he doesn't understand that Krishna is the Supreme Lord. And Lord Chaitanya wants to help him. So Lord Chaitanya is sort of, you could say, not confrontational about it. But he's very kind of, you know, diplomatic or just very gentle. And he introduces the discussion by saying, you know, Lord Chaitanya says, you know, I'm, I'm a little confused about something. Can you help me? To Venkata Bhatta. He says, you know, you, you people always say that Narayan is the Supreme Lord, Supreme of all forms of the Lord. And Krishna is just an expansion for pastimes. Well, if that's the case, can you please explain why did Lakshmi leave Narayan to enter the rasa dance with Krishna? Lord Chaitanya is expressing himself like, I am perplexed. <laughs> please enlighten me. And then Gadabhata says, sure, no problem, no problem. N Krishna is a form of Narayan, who's the husband of Lakshmi. And it's only natural for the wife to want to associate with the husband in all different aspects of his life. So there's nothing wrong with Lakshmi wanting to, uh, to enter the rasa dance. It's normal. It's normal for a, a faithful wife. And Lord Chaitanya says, Oh, thank you so much for helping me. Thank you so much. But I'm still perplexed. Can you please explain that, you know, according to what you've said, how is it that Lakshmi was not able to enter the Rasa dance? And she, although she tried and tried and tried, she couldn't do it. And Venkata Bhatta says, you know, I cannot understand that. I think you will have to explain that to me. And he says, actually, I think you're the Supreme Lord. So then Lord Chaitanya explains that Lakshmi, who is, you know, she's a big person sitting on massive gold throne encrusted with gems and herself just, you know, all this jewelry and whew, super opulent. 
no plastic bangles from Shanghai or anything of that sort. It's all the real thing. And she's worshipped with great awe and reverence in very formal ways. And she likes it. In a transcendental sense, she's attached to that. So when she came to enter the Rasadans, when Krishna was here 5,000 years ago, she wanted to enter the Rasadans as Lakshmi, dressed, decorated in the same way, maybe with an entourage of assistants. But to enter the Rasadans or to just enter the pastimes in Vrindavan, you have to follow in the footsteps of the bridge buses and in this case, particularly the gopis. So Lord Chaitanya explains, Lakshmi would have to become a little gopi girl and learn how to live as a gopi, making cow dung patties and just cleaning around and just doing everything in a very humble and simple way uh, in order to enter the rasa dance or just in order to enter the pastimes. But she couldn't do it because she has this, it's a transcendental attachment. It's not just a material attachment to money or something like that, but this transcendental attachment to being Lakshmi, the great goddess of fortune. So as we understand, she tried, she performed austerities. As we understand, she's still doing the austerities 5,000 years later. And she is still in a place called Bhadravan. It's on the other side of the Yamuna. And there is the temple of Mahalakshmi. And there she's still performing austerities in the hope of entering the Rasa dance but she still has not. So like this, we should understand that uh, that Aishvarya is not higher than Madhurya. Actually, the most attractive thing is love. Love is more attractive, is nicer, more relishable than, you know, grandeur, greatness, magnificence. And Prabhupada says, Prabhupada gives the example of a high court judge. In the court, he's a big man. People have to sort of bow down and he's your honor, something like that. He's not just one of the guys. And in some countries, they have to walk out of the the court backwards. They can't even turn their back on the judge. But when the judge goes home, Prabhupada says, then his wife does not meet him like, your honor, <laughs> and all that. <laughs> but she says to him, you got to take the rubbish out. <laughs> and, you know, whatever else. And he's just a member of the family. So which is better, when he's at work or when he's at home? When he's at home is better because there's love. It's relishable. And in fact, when he's at work, he is working to support the home. He's not at home to support the work. So the home is higher. Therefore, Prabhupada said, Krishna in Vrindavan, is Krishna at home? Yeah. And home is where the heart is. So this is the highest. Let's go on to, what's next? Dainaka Sura. Ooh, Dainaka Sura. Represents the mode of ignorance, you remember. And it's, it's, Quite an involved pastime, actually, if you really get into it. You know, some of these 
pastimes and the anathas they represent, you can sort of see the anatha in the pastime. Not all of them, but in some of them, and this is one. That Danica Sura, the, the, the anatha is ignorance. And Danica Sura is in the form of a donkey. And donkeys are just sort of, you know, the, the natural manifestation of ignorance. Yeah. If you say that someone is like a donkey, it means he's really stupid. So the cowherd boys, oh, this is now when Krishna had just turned six. He has entered his Poganda period. His Poganda period. And they're going down past Govardhan Hill, and down past Govardhan Hill, kind of to the south to some degree, is Talavan. And they're going past Talavan. And the cowherd boys smell all this ripe fruit, beautiful fruit. And they want to, uh, to enjoy it. Well, they, actually, they don't want to enjoy it. They want to offer it to Krishna and Balaram. But, just so Krishna and Balaram would help them get it, they told Krishna and Balaram, we want some of this fruit, will you help us get it for us? Because Krishna and Balaram will not refuse their devotees. But if they had said, we want to offer it to you, then Krishna and Balaram would have said, no, don't worry, no problem. We have our lunch boxes. You know, when children go to school, they take a lunch box. Right, Tushti? You take a lunch box? Krishna, when he goes out to herd the cows, calves, cows, he takes a lunch box. But his lunch box is better than your one, Tushti. In Krishna's lunch box, you wouldn't believe it is every preparation you can think of, and many you can't. There's, so, there's plenty of shushu, plenty of gropwa, so you don't need to worry. And there's dal puri, oh yes. And you know, I would say perhaps the thing I most appreciate in Mauritian cuisine, Mauritian karela done with mustard. Oh, that is just first class. It's better than shushu. <laughs> you might not believe it. And even better than gros pois. So Krishna in his lunchbox, he has everything. Every type of samosa you can imagine. Different types of chutneys. Different types of sabjis and so on, and sweets, including, are you familiar with chum chum? That's a question. If you're not, you've wasted at least 10% of your life. If it's done properly, which is not easy, ha, it's truly out of this world. Okay, anyway. So, yeah, they they are going past Talavan, and the boys ask help to get fruit. And so Krishna and Balaram, they go in with them into Talavan. There was so much ripe fruit there because Dainakasura, the donkey demon, would kill anyone. He wouldn't let anyone take the fruit. He would kill anyone, even birds, if they flew in to get some fruit. He'd kill them. But he didn't eat the fruit. He was, as they say, on the airplanes in India, he was non-veg. Dainakasura was non-veg. So, so the fruit would just get ripe and fall and rot, and that was it. 
So Lord Balaram put his arms around one big tall tree, which is a type of palm. It's a type of palm. And shook the tree, and some tall fruits were falling. Danakasura was sleeping nearby. And Lord Balaram shook the tree so, so strongly, the whole planet shook. The whole planet shook even here in Flack. If you go through the old historical records from 5,000 years ago, you'll find suddenly there was a big earthquake. Yeah. So Danikasura, he's, he's not just your ordinary donkey. He's, he's a giant, massive donkey. He came running over thinking... Uh, he came running over, in English we call it braying, braying, this is making donkey noise. Can anyone demonstrate a donkey noise for us? Even ladies if you want. I thought you might be too embarrassed. Anyway, you know what, donkey, what donkeys sound like. And he attacked Lord Balaram. And it's a long story. We don't have time today to get into all the details. But in the end, he came and tried to kick Balaram in the chest. Actually sort of tried to trample him, just run over him. Balaram, with one hand, with his left hand, because you know, you don't touch dirty things with your right hand, with your left hand. With his left hand, he took both of his front legs, spun him around, and that was the end of Danakasura. <clears throat> like we said, Danakasura represents the mode of ignorance. So how are we going to get out? How are we going to deal with this anatha of ignorance? Well, a simple answer, of course, is read Prabhupada's books. But how, how are we really going to get a taste for reading Prabhupada's books. Because sometimes devotees find them a bit philosophical or heavy going. Even Prabhupada once was asked, is there a Krishna conscious cure for insomnia? You can't sleep at night. <coughs> and Prabhupada answered, yes, read Srimad Bhagavatam. You may have seen people fall asleep during Bhagavatam class. There's a famous story, which I haven't got time to tell you the whole story, of a Bhagavatam class, I think it was in France, many years ago, like the 70s. Everyone fell asleep, including the devotee who was giving the class. <laughs> <laughs> this is like... A record. It's for the Guinness Book of Records. <laughs> so, okay, so how are we going to get an attachment for reading Prabhupada's books to get us out of ignorance? Well, you know, there are many things we could say, and we could even just have a whole seminar just on this subject. But there is a verse in the Bhagavatam. It is 1, 2, 16. You may be a bit familiar with it. Shushru Sho Shraddhanasya Vasudeva Kata Ruchi Syan Mahatsevaya Vipra Punya Tirtha Nishavanat. You know that verse. It's very important. 1 2 16. That by serving, by serving the devotees who are completely freed from all vice. Great service is done. By that service, one gains an affinity for hearing the messages of Vasudev. Affinity, I mean, you could just say an attraction. So the point there is that if we serve the devotees, we will get an attraction. Vasudeva kata ruchi literally means a taste for hearing the kata 
Krishna Kata means the Bhagavatam. It also includes the Hare Krishna Mantra. Just any sound vibration to do with Krishna. So that verse is saying like that. If you serve the devotees, you will just find, oh, I am suddenly attracted to hearing about Krishna. How does it happen? What is the sort of mechanism? The mechanism is that when you serve the devotees, Krishna likes it. And Krishna thinks, I want to reciprocate in the best way possible with this devotee who is serving my devotees. So Krishna thinks, what's the best thing I can give? And he decides, yes, I will give an attraction, a taste for hearing about me. So you can think about that and you can put it into practice. Try serving the devotees regularly and nicely and see what develops in your life. So next, let's see, next is Kaliya, another very famous pastime. And Kaliya represents, you know, he's a snake, so what he represents is related to what Agasura represented. You know, it's connected with enviousness. <clears throat> Specifically, Kaliya represents poisoning the hearts of devotees with poisonous talk about other devotees. Is that what it says there? Yeah, yeah, that's the basic idea from Srila Bhaktivinoda Thakur. I think you know the story. You know, we could just do a seminar just on the story because it, you know, like Brihad Bhagavatam Rita, for example, has a whole expanded description of this pastime. It is amazing. It's very deep. And it also happened on Lord Balaram's appearance day, so Balaram was not there. He was back at home again having another birthday party. <clears throat> so, anyway, Krishna was out with the cowherd boys and the calves. Is it or is it the cows now? Anyway, I think it's still the calves. <clears throat> and they come down to the river where the current day Kaliyagat is, if you're familiar with Vrindavan town. They drink the water from the river and die on the spot. All the cowherd boys and all the, the calves, because the river was poisonous. Because Kaliya had been there <coughs> for many yugas. Many yugas. Kaliya is from some Satya Yuga, like back at the beginning of creation, you know, there are stories about all these demons, how they became demons, who they were before. We don't have time to go into it all. But one little point I could add, it's interesting, is that approximately half of the demons killed by Krishna in his Vrindavan Leela. Plus, or it's around half of the 21 became demons because they were cursed by Devasamuni, specifically. He is a big cursor. He curses quite liberally. <clears throat> and sometimes we say, Devasamuni, he's such a cursor. We say he is something like a serial cursor. <laughs> something like that. Anyway, in the case of Kaliya, he was not cursed by Devasa. But he was cursed by, who was it? Vedashira, I think. Vedashira. 
he, uh, he had an ashram, nice ashram, and devotees would just come and just drop in. And he'd realize, oh, some new person is staying in the ashram, I didn't realize. And he got a bit upset about that. <clears throat> People just sort of taking over his ashram. So this one sage came and this devotee said, what are you doing in my ashram? You shouldn't be here. And the other devotee, I think, Veda Shira said, you hiss just like a snake. Become a snake. And he became Kaliya, right at the beginning of creation. And, you know, like so many of these stories, it's a long story. But he ended up in the lake, it's called Kaliya Daha, which is kind of straight out from Kaliya Ghat, straight out from the Madan Mohan temple. If you're familiar with Vrindavan, if you look out, you'll see this kind of lower area of land. And behind it, there's a little raised area like a border. This was Kaliya Daha, the lake of Kaliya. So they all died. Krishna revived them all. And Krishna got very angry that this Kaliya is contaminating my Yamuna. And he decided to punish Kaliya. So, you know, another interesting little thing is that when Lord Chaitanya came to Vrindavan approximately 500 years ago, uh, Chaitanya Charitam Rita says the original tree at Kaliya Ghat, which Krishna walked out on the branch of and jumped into the Yamuna, the original tree was still there. It's 500 years ago. And they say, you know, them, those people who say things, they say the current tree is still the original tree. They say. Krishna walked out on the branch and he did two things which wrestlers do. Well, one of them is what wrestlers do. He tied his belt. Not exactly belt, but he has a cloth around his waist. He tied it tight, as wrestlers do. Then he made a funny sound by slapping his arms. You know, no one would demonstrate a donkey sound. Can anyone demonstrate this sound? It's like a, a schoolboy's joke. Anyway, I think you know the sound. He did that and he jumped in. And like I said, it's a long story. But initially, Krishna allowed himself to be caught by Kaliya for some hours. <clears throat> and eventually all the bridge buses came and everyone's distraught for some hours, seeing Krishna there just sort of pinned. He apparently can't move. Caught by Kaliya. Therefore, this pastime is said by our Acharyas that it is said that in this pastime the second most separation is felt by the bridge buses. The most separation is when Krishna leaves Vrindavan. This is now where the second most is displayed. <coughs> so anyway, you know, like I said, it's a long story. It really is. But Krishna eventually broke, th broke free, jumped on the heads of Kaliya, started dancing, called the gopis, had a rasa dance on the heads of Kaliya. And Krishna, you know, Krishna is everything. All the universes are within Krishna. Mother Yashoda, when she looked in Krishna's mouth, saw the universe. It was, it's within Krishna. In other words, Krishna is no lightweight. 
Krishna is extremely heavy. And if you can imagine everything dancing on your head, pounding, he was dancing in Katak style. You know what is Katak style? Stamping the feet. Yeah, heavy, dancing on Kaliya's head, Katak style. And Kaliya was about to die. But because this was Krishna's feet, Lord Brahma and Lord Shiva offer prayers to get one speck of dust from Krishna's foot on their head and they'll be happy. Kaliya got Krishna's feet just constantly beating on his head for a long time. What mercy is that? Oh, it is inconceivable. So Kaliya, his mind changed. And he, um, Sanatan Goswami, I think Sanatan Goswami explains that he became too much in pain. Sanatan Goswami, he was so much in pain, he could not speak. But within his mind, he just prayed, I am yours, I am yours. And Krishna accepted him. And there's an interesting comment by Madhvacharya. One who simply thinks with devotion that the punishment which the Lord is giving me now is actually mercy upon me. Such a person becomes pious or advances in Krishna consciousness. But, though, but for those who continue, even after punishment from the Lord, to envy him, their attitude is the reason for their continuing to fail to recognize him. Anyway, digest that one. It's a good one. It's a really good one. So anyway, the anatha is poisoning the hearts of devotees. Uh, maybe you've had experience. Some devotee walks up to you and starts talking. You know, it could be about anyone, but it's often about the temple president. That you know X, Y, Z does. He's really nice. And you, you hear that and you think, yeah, that's good. But, but, and then comes the poison. But, he does this and that and various things. And, you know, I don't really like him. And you're there, your, your heart has opened a little because you heard the person say, he's really nice. So your heart just opened a bit, but then in goes the poison. And you know you've, your heart has beca become poisoned if, when you meet that devotee who was being criticized next time, you know your heart has become poisoned if, when you see him, you think, ah, there he is, <laughs> that bad devotee. You just spontaneously think, start thinking negatively about him. So anyway, if you, if you haven't got something good to say about a devotee, don't say anything at all. But try to, to say good things. But don't say things like this. Because you know, you know what happened to Kaliya. Krishna didn't kill him, but Krishna kicked him out of Vrindavan. Told him to go even though Kaliya now is a devotee. He surrendered to the Lord. He became a devotee. But Krishna wouldn't let him stay. They say he went to Fiji. Which may or may not be. But anyway, the thing is, if you do that, if we do that, particularly if we become serial poisoners, 
After some time, the devotees are not going to tolerate. They're going to kick you out. And somehow or other, you'll find you get isolated from the association of devotees. Somehow. Maybe your work will take you to another country. Maybe to Timbuktu, where there are no devotees. There's just, you know, the Muslim revolutionaries. Something like that. Yeah, okay. So there's some thoughts. In his Bhagavad Gita commentary, Baladeva Vijabhushan says <clears throat> that a definition of envy is that a person will search to find faults in another person even in the middle of many good qualities. Who's next? Next, you know what we're going to do? We're going to actually do both forest fires because they're kind of similar. The first one, Sanan Goswami says, the first forest fire was a friend of Kaliya. How's that? Did you ever meet a friendly forest fire? But that's what he says. A friend of Kaliya, yes, Sanatan Goswami says. So, uh, and this is the night, the same night of the Kaliya Leela. The Leela took the whole day and they were there, all the bridge buses were there for hours just feeling agony. And then finally Krishna freed himself. So they decided not to go home, but they camp out. So they stayed at a place, it's called Vishram Kund. It's still there in Vrindavan. It's a, it's a nice kund. You should visit it sometime. Such a nice place for chanting japa. They stayed there for the night, and the fire came and encircled them, the first forest fire. <clears throat> and Krishna, not right by the kund, but just, it's now across the railway line, there's another kund. It's called Davanala kund. Davanala means, Davanala kund means the kund of the forest fire. Krishna there swallowed the forest fire. He told everyone, close your eyes. And, and I think Prabhupada, one of our acharyas, explains. Sanatan Goswami says that if you are going to do something magical in front of a friend, tell them to close their eyes. It's best that they don't see if you're going to do something magical. So just remember that, if ever you do something magical. And Krishna swallowed it, and for him, it tasted like a very nice nectar drink. And this uh, pastime represents, represents, what is it now? Intercommunal discord among Vaishnavas. You know, we don't have to go, we don't have time to get into details. But, you know, there's, there's all sorts of Vaishnavas. There's the Gaudiya Mutt. There's the Sri Vaishnavas we mentioned. We were just in Sri Rangam with the Sri Vaishnavas. And they're all a bit different. Even the Gaudiya Mat, there's significant differences. But we don't want to get into sort of like a war with them. That would be intercommunal discord amongst Vaishnavas. So we generally, as Prabhupada said, we offer respects from a distance. We don't get involved. We offer respects because they're Vaishnavas. But from a distance. With all these groups. The Gaudiya Mat, the Sri Vaishnavas, 
the Madfas, the Babajis. You know, we're always respectful, uh, but we don't get involved. That's how to avoid intercommunal discord. Then the second forest fire represents the second forest fire. It's just after the killing of Pr Pralambasura represents the influence of atheism. Krishna and Balaram were herding all the animals, goats, cows, buffaloes. They came to a nice place. It is by, the place is by, Bandiravan. Do you know Bandiravan? Do you know much about Vrindavan? Have you heard of Vrindavan? Yeah. Bandiravan, very nice place across the river, just north of Bhadravan, uh, where Mahalakshmi is. And this is where this pastime happened. That suddenly a great fire, which Vish both Srila Vishnath Chakravati Thakur and Sanatan Goswami was a friend of Pralambasuras, who had just been killed by Krishna. So he came to get, uh, to take revenge. Krishna, through his eyes, told the cowherd boys to close their eyes. What do you think of that? That's pretty cool. Through his eyes, told them, told them to close their eyes, because if they saw him swallow the fire, they would get into anxiety. What's happening to Krishna? Is he going to get burnt? So he told them to close their eyes. And the fire became frightened, Vishwanath Chakravati Thakur says, and it turned itself into an extremely cooling, fragrant drink. Anyway, atheism is the anatha, and, you know, I think we shouldn't, uh, we don't really need to hear a lot about atheism to know that it's just we don't get into atheism. Then there's Pralambasura, who rep represents the mode of passion and who was killed by Lord Balaram. Dainakasura was also killed by Balaram. Sometimes as a trick question, we ask devotees. How did Krishna kill Dainakasura? And oftentimes they say, yes, he caught him by his legs and spun him around. But of course it's not correct because Balaram killed Dainakasura. But an interesting little point, in other scriptures, actual like Puranas, there are other stories of the killing of Dainakasura from other Kalpas. And there's a description of Krishna killing Dainakasura. Yeah. Fighting with Dainakasura. But in the middle of it all, Dainakasura became a devotee. And he said to Krishna, Kill me. Please kill me now. So I can go back to God. Please kill me now. But Krishna said, I can't kill you, you're a devotee. And Dainakasura said, don't worry about it, just kill me. Let me just get out of this whole condition. So Krishna turned him back into a demon again and killed him. Anyway, that's by the way. So Pralambasura, Pralambasura, let's have a look. He... Pralambasura. This took place. He disguised himself as a cowherd boy. And he wanted to kill Krishna and Balaram. So there was a competition. You know, I could get into a whole thing about the competitions Krishna and Balaram have with the cowherd boys, but we haven't got time. There was a team competition. 
Krishna was on one side, Balaram on the other. Pralambasura disguised in the form of a coward boy was in Krishna's team, the team that Krishna was in. Balaram's team lost. So the members of the team that Balaram was in had to carry on their shoulders the boys from the team that Krishna was on. And Pralambasura, as a cowherd boy, ended up on Balaram's shoulders. And Krishna, very in very subtle ways, informed Balaram, this is a demon, he wants to kill us. So Balaram took him away. Pralambasura's up. I mean, uh, no, I'm sorry, wait a minute, I'm confused. The team that Pr Pralambasura was on lost, and Pralambasura carried Balaram. Excuse me. And Pralambasura took Balaram away in order to kill him away from Krishna and the others. But then uh, Balaram, suddenly Pralambasura started expanding his body to its normal monstrous size. And Balaram to that point had not known this is a demon. Now Balaram knew and he started punching him on the head. Yeah, Balaram's team won. Pralambasura was on Krishna's team. They lost. And so Pralambasura carried Balaram. So, Pralambasura's head immediately split in two. He vomited blood and fell to the ground and attained impersonal liberation. So he represents the mode of passion, basically. Uh, the essence of the mode of passion. Sometimes devotees think that if we're very active, doing this and doing that and running around a bit, this is the mode of passion. It is not necessarily, of course it may be, but really what is the foundation of the mode of passion is I'm doing this so I enjoy. That's the mode of passion. Otherwise, devotees should be very active in, in Krishna consciousness. Prabhupada talked about uh, active intelligent, lazy intelligent, active fool, and lazy fool. The best is lazy intelligent. The next best is active intelligent. Then you've got lazy fool and active fool. Which do you think is worse? Active fool is worse because lazy fool will just sleep and just do nothing. Active fool will run around creating chaos. So active fool is worse. So yeah, being active is not necessarily a symptom of being in the mode of passion. It may just be a symptom of being enthusiastic to serve the Lord. But, but when it becomes the mode of passion is when there's some selfish desire involved. So that we should... Uh, you know, we should avoid that. When we, when we do this in length, we talk about the description that's there in the Gundicha Leela, Lord Chaitanya cleaning the Gundicha temple, how, uh, you know, Lord Chaitanya had the devotees clean the temple once, and it was spotless. And then he had, had them clean it again even though it was already spotless. But the second time, they got more dirt than the first time, even though at the end of the first time, 
They thought they had everything. So Srila Prabhupada, quoting Srila Bhakti Siddhanta, explains that uh, even though when we first take to Krishna consciousness, we come to the point of following the regulative principles, <clears throat> we may think, yes, my heart is clean, I'm okay, I'm there. But actually, subtle contamination remains. Things like fault-finding, there's a whole list. Duplicity, fault-finding, the desire for name and fame desire for material gain, accepting things forbidden in scripture. You know, we visit temp uh, devotees' houses often, and sometimes just to check things out, we look in the fridge when no one's watching. And you know what we find sometimes? Oh, we find all sorts of things. Sometimes we find uh, you know, some shop bought acha, and on the list of ingredients is onions and garlic, because <laughs> devotees have not been very careful. Oh, it's vegetarian, it's okay. So anyway, this is all connected with the mode of passion, subtle enjoyment even, so we should be very careful about that. Next is the Govardhan Leela. Look, number, oh no, it's, it's the Brahmins, sorry about that. It's the Brahmins performing sacrifice. And the Anatha is to be attached to your position in Varnashram. I am a big Brahmin. Or at least, you know, in Hindu society it's still there to some degree in India at least. Uh, it can even be there in Krishna consciousness. I am first initiated. I am senior to you. You are just a bhakta. Huh. So there can be this, these types of feelings because of position in Varnashram. So it's a bit of a long story and, I, you know, we just don't have time. Krishna and Balaram sent the cowherd boys to get food from the Brahmins because they were feeling hungry. They were feeling hungry after the pastime of stealing the, the clothes of the gopis. This is, who is it? Sanatan Goswami, Sridhar Swami. They explain like this. So the boys went and asked in the names of Krishna and Balaram, and the Brahmins refused. You Vaishas, who do you think you are? Krishna and Balaram, they're just Vaisha boys. We are big Brahmins. So they refused. But then Krishna and Balaram sent the boys to ask the wives of the Brahmins for food. And they came. And they served Krishna and Balaram very nicely. And they didn't want to leave. They became attracted to Krishna. And they spoke a verse it's there in the Bhagavatam. It is the same verse as one of the verses spoken by the gopis when they didn't want to leave Krishna before the Rasadans. But Krishna replied, he tried to say, no, no, you should go home. In the case of the gopis, they, they wouldn't go home. In the case, case of the Brahmins' wives, they went home. So they're not on the level of the gopis. And next, next is the Govardhan Leela. What a classic Govardhan Leela. Overcoming the pride of Lord Indra. You all know this pastime, don't you? Of course you know this pastime. Krishna is now seven. 
It's just after his birthday, because you know Govardhan Puja is shortly after Janmashtami. Krishna just turned seven. There are so many things we could say. But we don't have time. So Indra, Indra was thinking that Krishna's becoming puffed up and the coward people are just stupid. So he sent that great storm. I don't know if you've ever been to Paita. Have you been to Paita? Paita or Paita? It's just out from Govardhan Hill on the eastern side. There is, that is said to be where Krishna was just before the storm came. And there is a tunnel from there, it's a couple of kilometers, to Govardhan Hill, they say. And Krishna went through the tunnel because the, the rain had already started. So Krishna lifted the hill. Uh, Indra sent so many clouds, the Samvartika cloud, and many others. And Indra was waiting in the background, and he was beating the clouds. The clouds would just give all their rain and come back and take more water from the sea. And Indra would, was just beating them until the clouds became exhausted and they were ready to die. Can you imagine some dead clouds around? And then after a week, Indra thought, let me go and have a look. And he went and had a look and everything was fine. There was no flooding. No distraction, no dead bodies. And Indra thought, whoops, mistake. Oh gosh, what have I done? And can you imagine, you know, if you realize you've offended a person badly, how do you feel? And particularly, can you, have any of you, have any of you ever tried to kill someone? Haribo. It's just a joke. <laughs> but can you imagine if you tried to actually kill someone? And in this case, Indra tried to kill so many. Radha and Krishna, Mother Yashoda, the cows, like mass destruction. And then he realized, I've made a mistake. Can you imagine how he felt? You know, we haven't got time to go into the details, but there's a description that's actually in uh, Gopal Champu, Srila Jiva Goswami. Indra was going to commit suicide because it was just too much. He just couldn't deal with it. I've been too offensive. But his guru, Brihaspati, came and told him and laughed at him and said, you're going you're gonna to commit suicide. What a joke. You're already worse than dead. So don't waste your time. Anyway, again, it's one of those long stories. You, you can read the story in our Govardhan book, actually. And he came and apologized to Krishna, and they had the Abhishek. And the idea is we shouldn't worship demigods. We should worship Krishna, who's the Lord of the demigods. Then, where are we? We need to move, can we just, well, hang on, let's see if this works. Oh, oh, it didn't work, what happened? Where, where are we? Okay, you know, we're almost there, devotees. Sure. We don't really have enough time, but anyway. So now, Nanda Maharaj, stolen by Varuna. <clears throat> Nanda Maharaj was doing a special Ekadasi fast. 
And he had to break it at a specific time. And part of the process of breaking it was bathing in the Yamuna at a specific time early in the morning. So, oh no, um, where, where are we? Oh no, wait a minute. Okay, okay, yeah. So, this one assistant of Varuna, when, when Nanda Maharaj was bathing in the Yamuna, this one assistant of, of Varuna, who was in Maya, he was in a bewildered state of mind, he thought Nanda Maharaj was doing something wrong, that you shouldn't bathe at this time. So he arrested Nanda Maharaj and took him to Varuna. And then Krishna came, and Varuna was very happy to receive Krishna, and Nanda Maharaj was released, and we don't know what happened to the assistant of Varuna, but even it said he was a demon. Yeah. And he didn't understand the situation. So he represents, this pastime represents, thinking that spiritual life can be enhanced by intoxication. Hari Bol. What's the favorite in Mauritius? Is it Ganja? Or is it some cane spirit? What's the favorite? You don't know, do you? Congratulations. <laughs> That's good. <laughs> anyway, there's some favorite, I don't know. In Russia, it's vodka. Pronounced vodka. In South Africa, it's cane spirit. It's the favorite, along with marijuana, which they call daka. A rand a hand. At least back, we heard, many years ago. As much as you could hold, people would come with just sacks of it. As much as you could grab in one hand, it would cost one rand. A rand a hand. Anyway, we don't need to say much about that, do we? <laughs> I hope not. I'm sure not. Then, there's Nanda Maharaj rescued from the snake. Now, there are sort of somewhat different versions about this. That, you know, where did they go? It was Shivaratri time, February, March. I don't think they came to Grand Bassin. Is it Grand Bassin? I don't think they came there. But there are different versions. Maybe they were by the Saraswati. So they, you know, at Shivaratri, so they did all sorts of different offerings for Lord Shiva as a devotee. And during the night, a snake came and tried to swallow Nanda Maharaj. And um, the, the men tried to beat the snake with burning logs and pieces of wood, but it kept swallowing Nanda Maharaj. So Krishna came and put his lotus foot on the snake and the snake transformed into a demigod, Vidyadara. His name was Vidyadara, and he was a Vidyadara. He was a leader of the Vidyadaras. Uh, and, you know, it's a long story, but he was cursed not by Devasamuni, but by Angira to become a snake. And Krishna delivered him. Uh, you know, he went back to the heavenly planets. And what does he represent? Impersonalism, isn't it? Yeah, impersonalism. You know, it's possible even in Krishna consciousness to become influenced by impersonalism, to become influenced 
Uh, I mean, it's extremely rare that a devotee will become a full-fledged impersonalist. Although in, Nectar, in uh, Chaitanya Charitamrita, Prabhupada talks of one situation where someone, I think his name was Shiva Swami and his followers, they became impersonalists. But le at least as devotees, it's possible to become in influenced by subtle impersonalism. For example, if we don't take a devotee seriously, the person's a devotee, they're trying their best according to whatever's their best. But we think, ah, oh, you know, what sort of devotee is this? He's junior. He's not such a serious devotee. This, this can be due to a subtle influence of impersonalism. We don't recognize the person for what they are. You know, in material society, things like abortion. Abortion means, at least one perspective is, materialism influenced by impersonalism. That the little baby is not, not a real person. We don't need to treat this little baby as a real person. We can just kill the baby, throw the baby away, which is what they do. Uh, so it's literally impersonalism, because the child is a person. And one devotee, I won't mention his name, but he's quite a famous ISKCON devotee, told me that on his 21st birthday, his maternal grandmother told him, you know, I want to tell you this on this day. When my daughter, his mother, was pregnant with you, she wanted to, to abort you. But I convinced her not to. And I've waited all these years to tell you. And that devotee, 20, on his 21st birthday, his perspective on his mother changed, changed dramatically. Anyway, it's impersonalism. Sexism, these women, huh, look at these women, what are they good for? If they can cook shushu, it's better than nothing. Or racism, you know, being based in South Africa, we know all about this. You know, these non-whites, huh, who are they? It's impersonalism. I mean, it's the influence of impersonalism. Yeah. In, impersonalism is not just a sort of a spiritual philosophy of people who are practicing a type of spiritual life. It, it has the tendency to pervade the consciousness of people. So we should be very careful to take everybody seriously, and particularly the devotees, particularly the devotees, to take them very, very seriously, give them the credit they're due, and to treat them with great respect and, and care, because they are just the most special people. Even, even a real beginner is a special person. Yeah. You know, there's the famous verse, Bukti Mukti Spriha Yavat Pishachi Ridi Vartate. That Bukti, the desire for material enjoyment, and Mukti, the desire for liberation, Pishachi Ridi. They're like two witches in the heart. This is Lord Chaitanya and Chaitanya Charitamrita. But of the two, you know which is worse? 
Desire for materialism, just sense gratification. Desire for liberation. Lord Chaitanya makes it very clear the desire for mukti is worse. The desire for liberation in personal type of ideas. Okay, where are we? Wow. Where are we? Shank Achuda. Shankachuda. There's an interesting long story about Shankachuda actually, which we won't get into, but you probably know he was he was like a guard at the the uh, treasury of Kuvera. He represents the tendency to want sense gratification in the name of devotional servants. Uh, yeah. This pastime, this is interesting, this pastime took place on Gorponima Day. Sometimes it's interesting to know these things. The Damada Leela took place on Diwali Day. The uh, Krishna stealing the clothes of the gopis took place on the last day of this lunar month. Yeah, the last day. This is the month of Katyayani. So, Shankachuda tried to steal the gopis. And let us just say that he was unsuccessful. Krishna came and punched him in his head. And his head fell off. Yeah. So, and he had this gem on his, kind of somehow fixed in his forehead, somehow or other. And Krishna took the gem and gave it to Balaram and told him, give it to one of the gopis because Krishna didn't want to be seen by the gopis as favoring one of them. So the Anatha is to be inclined towards name and fame or enjoyment through devotional service. Let me give you an example. I will distribute books so I can take some of the money for myself because, you know, we just ask for donations. Some give a lot, some don't give much. There's no fixed price. No one knows how much I collected. I can just take some. Therefore, I will distribute books. Or well, we had one experience when I was a very new devotee. I'm still a new devotee. But when I was a very new devotee, that one of the also new boys, whenever a young, nice young girl would come to visit the temple, he would preach to her. Yes. And we told him, listen, why don't you preach to the young men who come and the ladies can preach to the ladies? And he said, Prabhu, Prabhu, I am preaching Krishna consciousness. So, yes. Don't, don't tell me what to do. Let us just say he did not last long. So look, we've only got three length left and we're meant to have finished five minutes ago. Anyway, what to do? Next is Arishtasura Ball. Oh, we were going to tell you about, oh yes, False religions. It's very interesting, actually. Uh, where is it? Let me just find. False. Oh my gosh, where is it? False religions. There are five types of false religions. Oh, here it is. There are five types. Let me just tell you what they are. 
You can find them in the back of a term, 7, 15, 12, 7, 15, 12, 13, and 14. They're listed out. First is, anyway, you can look there and get all the names and all the details. But first is Vidharma, means anti-occupational duty. You're doing something which is not according to your occupational duty. Then there is para dharma. They're all dharmas. Vi dharma, para dharma. Means trying to follow some process of religion which you are not fit for. Like trying to take sannyas when you're just 21 years old or something like that. Just, just don't bother thinking about it. Yeah, because you're not ready. Then there's Abbas Dharma. Abbas Dharma, which means, Abbas literally means like a reflection or manufactured religious principles. And then fourth is Upa Dharma. Upa. Upa means close to. Close to. Uh, so they're, they're sub-religious -relig sub principles, close to real religious principles. And they're things like uh, oh, things like even humility, pridelessness, tolerance, simplicity. You know, they're actually, of course, they're important in the context of Krishna consciousness, but not independent of Krishna consciousness. So they're sub-religious principles, moral, moral principles. Moral principles are considered sub-religious. And then fifth is chala dharma, means rascal interpretation. Then there's Keshi, the horse demon. Krishna killed him by forcing his left arm down his throat and suffocated him. And Keshi bit Krishna on the upper arm and the impression is still there. When you meet Krishna, look on his upper left arm, you'll see some teeth marks. They're from Keshi. And indeed, when Krishna, if some cowherd boy becomes a little puffed up and thinks he's stronger than Krishna, Krishna shows him, look at this. You remember Keshi? You want to you wanna fight with Keshi? Oh no, it's okay, thanks. <laughs> so he represents the Anatha, Keshi represents the Anatha of being puffed up and thinking you're a great devotee, a great guru, or even an avatar. And then there's Vyomasura, the last demon, who rep... Oh no, wait a minute. Okay, Keshi is slightly different. I'm a great devotee and spiritual master. Vyomasura, who Krishna killed at... Um, Kamyavan, the place is still there, represents associating with thieves, rascals, and even people who think they're avatars. Uh, yeah, because, you know, even as devotees, if we associate with people who are cheaters, we can become sort of cheating devotees. You know, there was a ph phenomenon at the, right at, in the la later stages of Prabhupada's time, where Prabhupada was emphasizing book distribution so much, it was big. Everyone practically was doing book distribution. 
But there was this idea that whatever you do to get someone to take a book, whatever you say, it's good. The proof of whether it's good or not is if they take the book or not. So if they take the book, whatever you said was good. <laughs> so devotees would tell all sorts of stories and say all sorts, all sorts of crazy things actually to get people to take books. Prabhupada found out, out after some time. But the thing is, we're conditioned souls. Conditioned souls have the tendency to cheat by definition. And it was like, it was rampant. It was rampant amongst the devotees. Tell them anything, say anything. But as a result, the Krishna consciousness movement for some time, particularly in America, became extremely unpopular because people thought we're cheaters. Yeah. So, uh, so you You know, an important quality, it's one of the 26 qualities of devotee is to be very honest and straightforward. Better to cultivate that than being expert at trickery. Hare Krishna. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go Premanande. More Premanande. Thank you. Thank you all for participating, participating particularly Bhakti Dear Dhamma Dhamma Raj. Just before we uh, close, we're going to do a little prize giving to some of our Bhaktivedanta College students. So don't go away for a couple of few minutes. Hare Krishna. Ki man ye, ki arive, tu korek. Okay, what would you say? Upu, no, I don't know how to say it. Will you be at the Rathayatra? Upu arive, uh, Rathayatra. <laughs> ale, upu ale, at Rathayatra. Wait. Bien bon. Okay, right, so there we go. So I should announce it, is it, or will you? Okay, so now we have one devotee here who has suc successfully completed the Bhakti Polganda certificate. Hari Bol. And we're going to give the certificate to her. Please, a round of applause for Ganesha Kishori Devi. Oh, Ganesha Kishori. Where's Ganesha Kishori? Oh. Hare Krishna, Ganesha Kishori. Hare Krishna. Oh, you're a good girl. Bon fiat. Hare Krishna. Merci beaucoup. Okay, now we have another one who has completed the Bhakti Polganda certificate. This is Purnanam Pranav Kumar. Oh, Hare Krishna. Oh, okay. You know, could I make a suggestion? Why don't they just wait there and, and offer obeisances? Hare Krishna. Do they, what do they call you? Hurananam or Pranav? 
Hare Krishna. Okay. <laughs> Hare Bo. So next, Ram Sohok Kojushri Bhakti Kishore Certificate. Hare Krishna. Congratulations. Hare Krishna. Good girl. Another Bhakti Kishore Certificate. <coughs> Chuto Vidya Lakshmi. <coughs> Hare Krishna Chuto. Hare Bal. Good girl. Bon Fiat. Bon Fiat, is that correct? Bon? Fi. That's a boy, isn't it? Okay, okay. Bhakti Kishore certificate. For Hurku Tushya. Hari What a nice devotee. Hare Krishna. Merci Boko. Congratulations. Bhakti Kishore certificate. Malari Keshava. Hare Krishna. Thank you. All glories to Prabhupada. Another Bhakti Kishore certificate for Harnam Singh Rishab. <laughs> Hare Krishna. Congratulations. Another Bhakti Kishore certificate. Oh, how to pronounce this? Punut Arnav Sharma. Hare Krishna. Well done. Oh, okay, another Bhakti Kishore certificate for Punit Kurtik Sharma. Hare Krishna. Good boy. Bonfi. Another Bhakti Kishore certificate for Ram Sahok Kosal. Hare Krishna. There you go. Hare Krishna. Okay, well done. Uh, oh, look, this is a Bhakti Sudevi certificate. Higher level. Hare Krishna. Chuto Yamuna Devi. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Another Bhakti Sudevi certificate. For Lobit Kusbu. Hare Krishna. Well done. And last but not least, Bhakti Balaram certificate for Rawaji Nakul Rao Daya. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. I guess that's the end of the program, except. It's Premananda Prabhu's birthday. Do we have a cake or anything or something or just what? Okay, anyway, Hari Bol. His Grace Premananda Prabhu Ki. Srila Prabhupada Ki. Go Premanandi. Okay. Hello, hello, Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Krishna Krishna. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Hare Rama. Rama Rama. Rama Rama. Hare Hare. Hare Hare. Thank you very much for coming for this course. We are very grateful to Maharaj that he came and gave his association and this course was very inspiring and helping in our spiritual life. Hope we can continue to practice and further progress in our devotional service. We also thank you all for coming because if you were not you were not here the course would not take place. They take place all the books are here, but if you did not come then you would not have
having me in this course, so thank you very much. Uh, now, our next item is prasadam. So, <laughs> we serve you prasadam. So, you will just queue for the prasadam from the Empire for you to take away. And tomorrow is Sunday, please. Dance at 2.30. So, you are almost welcome. Come.